So while, while um, I, I let this person finish, uh, so again, that strategy of answering the quizzes. Uh, so we have a quiz every week, yes? They're about, they're, each time there are 10 questions. That means that over the semester you will answer you know, close to 150 questions about, yes? So what you basically do if you, every time you answer a question correctly, you accumulate points, right? So that's how you have to look at that, yes? Um, so, you know, if you're absent, you, you know, you don't accumulate points, right? Uh, I don't, I will not take that into account because I, can, I will normalize your grade, yes? But the idea is not that you make one very successful test and then don't ever show up for the quizzes again, right? So if you're not there to take the quiz, you know, you miss out more than one or two quizzes, you know, we'll have a serious talk because you know, you're supposed to be here. Okay. Um, then when you answer, please write your name. You, you don't have to write very much, right? You have to write your name, yes? And then, and, and then 10 letters, either a T or an F. So, you know, there, there's still people who just, you know, you know, I get, there's someone who writes this, right? And, you know, <laughs> and if it's not well written, it can be anything, right? So don't do this to me, okay? So this is a T and this is an F, right? And, and if you can't write these two letters, uh, you know, uh, I'm, you know you, it's going to be an error, okay? It's very simple and I'm not asking too much. And write your name nicely also. Um, you know, so I can, because there are two people who have very similar names and they, there's the, scribble their name, so I, I can't see the difference. I think there are two Mr. Shins, okay? So please write your name carefully so I, uh, I don't give your very high grade to your friend. Okay, good, so let's collect the, uh, the papers. Let's just bring them here in front and let's move on with uh, what we were doing. <coughs> right, and the best, you know, the best way to do well in this course is just, you know, participate to all the quizzes. And I, I really stick to what I've said in class. Um, uh, so, uh, if, if, you, if you go through the slides and the materials you've, you had, uh, you know, you should be okay um, in the course whatever level of difficulty we go into during the course. Okay, so we, we, we had arrived at, at the point on uh, Monday, on Tuesday, excuse me, that, um, you know, there's this whole body of theory of plasticity and, um, uh, and you know, and we're all happy about having a, a floor rule and everything like this and, and uh, know about R factors and, uh, and delta Rs and what the impact is on uh, strain increments and things like this. But uh, it also leaves you with the feeling that, you know, what can I do with this in practice? Uh, and uh, well, in practice, uh, when you go into the real practice of formability and plasticity, uh, you realize that actually stresses um, there's not much discussion about stresses in that case. In, pr in practice, very often, uh, uh, when uh, d there is discussion of formability, um, we, it's about strains that uh, the discussion goes. Hmm? So, uh, uh, so, because formability is a, a, a really nice subject in, um, in, in uh, basically t two areas, one of them is press forming that's really complex. You know, there's, there's a lot of interest in that. And, and then massive uh, forming, which, which is basically, um, uh, you know, where you have big blocks of material and, you know, you shape them, you, you shape them in a, a specific uh, form. So that you have large deformations. That's be, it, it, the areas, in these areas, people are interested in, you know, in plasticity. And, and of course, there's a lot of work in plasticity, which is related to 
fracture, you know, and what, what goes on before fracture. Certainly when, we, we're, when we'll be talking about uh, plastic fracture, you know, this, the, the plasticity will pop up again um, as, as a subject. But, so we'll focus on sheet forming. And in sheet forming, um, you know, you have these big presses, yeah, um, where you, you basically form objects like, like these. Many things around us are, um, are made like this by, by presses. And the material you start with is, is sheet steel. It's just flat sheet. And that can be, of course, steel, but you know, we have also sheet. Uh, other metals and alloys are, are available as sheet to make parts. Um, aluminum alloys, magnesium alloys, titanium alloys, uh, zinc uh, are, are uh, to name a few. So you can see it here. It's a nice uh, picture. Mm? You see these, uh, the sheet material is it's cut into blanks. So he's got a stack of blanks here. Yes. Um, you, see, you see they're oval shaped here. And uh, so he puts it in the press. Yes. And, and then out come these parts. Yes. And, and you know, and, and then um, you have to cut the, uh, trim the edges. You, you may have to uh, punch holes in this. Uh, you may have to do some surface coating, yes, uh, to, to get the final part, yes. Um, and, uh, and, and so this is a manual press. You know, and, and, uh, you know for automotive uh, applications, you have big, huge transfer presses where, where you have huge presses one after the other, and they each do part of the of the, the deformation till, till the, you get the final part. Hmm? Okay, so, uh, and, uh, and obviously um, we don't see this guy here, you know, what he does is just he presses two knobs and, and there it goes. So he's not doing much stress measurements or wondering about von Mises yield criteria, yeah? Um, so there is a little bit, um, um, you know, a big divide between um, making a real life parts, yes, like, like these side panels of a car. And then when you're making a material, yes, and trying to evaluate how, how it will behave in this application, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so people will do research, they will do uh, quality control on, on sheet products to evaluate how this material will work in this situation, right? And obviously, uh, so they'll do some, they'll, they'll use special parts, you know, laboratory uh, part here. This is, a, 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 it looks very nice. It's a, it's a nice part that's been designed. So it, it tests the material in all possible difficult forming situation, but it's not used for anything else. You know, it's not a real part. Hmm? And it's also a part that people use, uh, develop, for instance, to see if when they do a finite element simulation, whether their calculations mimic reality. Hmm? To see how they, it's basically validating, they call this validating a code, yeah? or, a, or basically a program. Hmm? Um, and uh, so that's one thing. But in, in this is all already the domain of research. But in practice, uh, you know, when you want to s quickly evaluate um, the, the formability of, of a material, you have simple tests. And we'll talk about three simple tests today. Hmm? And one of them is the cup, cup drawing test. It looks like a very simple test. And, um, and, and we'll see how this test uh, uh, helps us to uh, uh, define formability in practice. And then we'll also uh, we'll, we'll talk about two other tests, um, the, the so-called hold expansion test and, and the uh, spring back test. Mm -hmm. um, and the reason why I want to, to, to uh, say this is because uh, when you do a tensile uh, test, I've already told you, you can determine the R value, yeah? The R value. And that's, uh, we already know, that's a measure of formability. But there, that's not the only measure of formability. There are other things people are interested in, and, and so that's what we'll be talking about, and, and, and go a little bit in, into detail so 
uh, you get an idea of the complexity. So, so this particular uh, uh, excuse me, uh, cup here that I just showed you on the on the right, yes, okay, that's that's made with a um, a, a sheet forming test machine, yes, and. Uh, and uh, yeah, in many laboratories, uh, people use this, this machine that's built by Ericsson, but there are other ones, yes. And uh, what you basically, there, there are two basic uh, parts in this machine, yes. And that is a punch and a die, yes. And what do these uh, parts do? Right. Right. Oh, yes, I'll just, I'll, well, okay. Um, so look at the cross section on the upper right here. So you, you, you have um, your die, yes? You put on this die a small circular uh, uh, blank, yes? You clamp it between the so-called blank holder, that's the, the, the top ring there, yeah? And then you punch, you use a punch to push the sheet into the, uh, the die. Hmm? And so if I interrupt the test uh, on its way to making a, a full cup, you see, I, you have this hat shaped, yes? And what happens it, when you push down the, uh, the punch, the diameter of the, flat, of the uh, blank decreases as you punch down the material, right? And so the material is, is pulled into this circular uh, cylindrical uh, hole. Hmm? Okay, and, and so we have uh, three parts to this cup. Hmm? A flange part, yes, a wall part, and a bottom part, yes? And they each undergo a different, what we call a strain path, yes? Hmm? Okay, uh, and, and so this is sideways, you see you have a die, yes? Hmm? You have a blank holder who keeps this flange flat, yes, and you have a punch, okay? Good. So, right, so first of all, when you uh, uh, do the simple test, one of the first things you see after you make the, uh, the cups is that, well, some cups uh, have a nice flat uh, edge, yes, other cups have edges with waves, which may be uh, very pronounced or not very pronounced, usually four. Uh, and uh, that tells you already the appearance of this, uh, we call them ears, yes, tells you that this material is anisotropic. Yes, it's got R values that change with direction. Okay, so uh, we already uh, see things that uh, tell us something about uh, the uh, 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 formability, okay? Okay. What happens um, um, during the, the test here, okay? So, um, first of all, the test is, you, you just don't go about and just, you know, put this thing in and, and, and go and uh, make a cup. You, know, you have specific test conditions, yes, which you have to determine. What are the good test conditions? Yes, and these test conditions, once you have determined them, will also tell you something about formability of the material. Mm -hmm. So, but let's just uh, look at a little bit more detail in this um, uh, uh, the, the flow of the material. Mm -hmm. So. Say we, we have interrupted the test and we have this hat shape, yes? Um, what happens in the flange part? You see, the um, original blank is basically a circular, like a 12 centimeter or whatever, cent you know, that order of magnitude, 10 centimeter uh, diameter sheet material, yeah? And then you, as you punch it in, yes, you make Yes. Um, the, this edge moves towards the center, okay? So the material at the edge here, yes, this, the, the, the radius 
or the uh, outer radius here, is squeezed into this radius. Yeah? So if you squeeze material yeah, into, you know, that's, that's this wide, into something that's this wide, yes, what has to happen? The material gets thicker. Yes? So you get a thickening of the flange part of the blank. So the, the thickness changes. Uh, so you can see it here, what, what we've done is we've taken um, uh, a cup, we cut, just cut it, just cut it, yes, and uh, it's, it's about um, one point, uh, I think 1.3 in thickness here, yeah, at the bottom, yes, and if we go up, we can see that it, you clearly see that it becomes thicker, yes, and that's because we in the flange, you squash the material and you make it longer. Yes? Okay? Um, right. And, uh, you, another thing that's really uh, interesting here is as we cut the, uh, uh, this, uh, the wall loose, yes, it curls. Yes? Uh, what does this tell you? That tells you that there is uh, that, that you have very high internal stresses in your materials, in your material. Mm -hmm. So we won't be talking about this, uh, but it's, it's something I want you to be aware of because it's, it, you could see it here on, on the image, is that any time you deform things, yes, and it looks perfectly flat, you know, perfectly straight, there are very high, there may be very high internal stresses in this material, yes? And, and, and they appear when you cut it off, when you cut parts out. And in the cup is, is no difference, okay? Uh, at, uh, we'll talk this in, in more detail, so, um, so you have a thickening of the flange. The wall here is, um, is in what we call plain strain conditions. I already told you that that's a rather uh, scary condition because Every lengthening is directly translated in thinning of the wall. And then at the bottom, yes, we have thinning of the uh, bottom part of the blank because we have stretching conditions. So we, have, or we can already see different stress states in different parts of the cup. Hmm? All right, let's see. So um, if, if we um, look at the, the stress situation yeah, in the, uh, during the cup forming, it's actually rather complex and it changes. Mm -hmm. So and um, okay, so what, what so these are would be the, um, the circles of the um, your, your Mises circles, right? And you could actually, uh, determine what is what is the stress situation, for instance, at the bottom of the cup, as you um, uh, as you uh, as you do the the pressing. Yes. So, and, and so this is shown here. You have here is the change of the stresses uh, in this area. Yes. And this is the change of the stresses in the flange. So in the flange, you have different stress conditions, different stress state than in, in the flange here, right? And in the, the bottom, yes? And it also changes, uh, the severity of the stresses change during the test. Mm -hmm. You can see here that you have plane strain, yes? Excuse me, um, okay, the plane strain uh, refers to this the, the, the wall part, not, not the, uh, this, the, the flange part, which is in, in this so-called deep drawing uh, 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 stress state. In deep drawing, we have compression in one direction and pulling in the and tension in the other perpendicular direction. And you can see that as you go, the stresses in the um, in this part here, increase very appreciably uh, during the, uh, the test. Hmm? 
Okay. Good. So let's go and um, see, say something about the flange part. Yes, the flange part. So we, we know that this thing, this outer ring has to go move in here. Yes? What happens if, uh, when you do this, if you, uh, if you, tr if you try to, uh, to do this in, um, with a piece of cloth, for instance, you try to push a piece of cloth into, the, into uh, this hole, for instance, you will see the piece of cloth will start developing wrinkles. Yes? The same thing happens here. If I don't apply a blank holder force here, yes, to keep, to keep the flange flat, the flange will develop wrinkles, yes? And your cup will not look like this, but will look like this, yes? So these wrinkles, yes, that were under the blank holder were, you know, were basically deep drawn and, and you get this, this uh, obviously really bad uh, cup. Hmm? So, The point I'm trying to make is that the blank holder, the force we use on this blank holder, and the size of the uh, blank relative to the diameter of the punch are important parameters, okay? So we need to look at the, at the ratio of the blank diameter relative to the punch diameter. And this ratio is called the drawing ratio. So that's an important parameter of formability. Another important uh, parameter is, of course, the blank holder force. Okay? Let's see how we work this out in practice. Okay? And you will already see that um, formability is also visible in this type of test, okay? On this graph, uh, I, it's a schematic, hmm? I show on the x-axis the so-called drawing ratio, yes? The drawing ratio is the ratio of the blank diameter on the punch diameter. Hmm? So when the blank, the, uh, the, the ratio is two, it means that I have a uh, a diameter, a blank diameter that's twice the diameter of the punch, okay? Okay, and on the y-axis I have the blank holder force, right? So when it's zero, I have no blank holder, f there's no blank holder force, yes? Okay. So now let's imagine I have a not too wide a um, blank, and I have no blank holder force, no blank holder force, and I'm just punching a cup without blank holder force. The flange will start to form uh, waves. Yeah. We get wrinkling, yes? As I increase the blank holder force, yes, I can suppress this wrinkling. I can suppress the wrinkling, yeah? I can suppress the wrinkling, and I can make a nice cup, yes? Okay. But how high is, can I go? You know, how, how, how strong can I press the, the blank holder? Okay, well, let's imagine we continue increasing the blank holder force. You know, make it very high, yes? At one time, the force on the blank holder will be so high that the material will be unable to flow, right? The material will be just stuck. It will just be stuck between the die and the blank holder. And uh, the cup will, will break. It will just break, yes? So, so there is a maximum, a maximum, yes, where the where I get fracture, yes? Okay. okay. 
So, now what happens to this maximum if I make the blank larger and larger? Yeah? Say I make a larger blank here. Yeah. Okay? Same. Same punch. Larger blank. Right? Because I have a larger blank, I will need less force, less blank holder force, to make the cup break. Yes? So this upper line decreases as I make the blank holder, uh, the blank size larger. In other words, when I increase the, 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 the drawing ratio, yes, this curve goes down. Yeah? Hmm? And eventually, the wrinkling line that's pretty much horizontal, yes, it moves up slightly, and the fracture line meet, yes, and it means that I can only form a cup within this range. Yes? Within this range of blank holder force and drawing ratios. Yeah? What is an important parameter of uh, formability is the maximum drawing ratio. The maximum drawing ratio is the maximum black diameter that where I will still be able to make a cup divided by the punch diameter. Yes? Okay. Now, say you're, you know, you don't know anything about plasticity. Yes? But you've done this test and you have two materials. And one material gives you this maximum drawing ratio. And another material, let's, uh, another material gives you this. Let's play this about the same. Yeah. Okay. Which one would you rather use in your press shop? Well, the one that's that's not going to you know, that's, that's going to uh, not break over a larger domain of stresses and drawing ratios. Yeah? Because this is, this is the range of uh, blank holder um, force, yes, for one of the materials, and this is the range of formability for the other material. So the other material is, will be easier to form than the, f the first material, the one that has the, the red uh, forming range, yes? So this parameter here, the beta, beta max, is a very important technical uh, 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 evaluation of formability, yes? You can also already see that having a you know, stronger material, yes, can improve your formability hmm? because it allows you uh, to use larger forces, yes, without uh, risk of fracture. Hmm? Okay. Right. Of course, uh, and, and here I want to come back to uh, the, the fact that uh, you have to take the, the idea of force in a broad sense, right? In, uh, because uh, if you increase formability, as I, I, I've told you, um, you can, it has an impact on the stresses at which the uh, deformation and, and um, eventual uh, fracture will occur. So in the, uh, in the bottom, you have a biaxial uh, stretching. In the flange, you have drawing, uh, because the, the material is um, 
squashed in this direction and pulled in this direction. So that's a, a drawing situation or pure uh, shear if you want. And then in the, uh, in the wall here, we have plane strain. Yes? Yeah. And, and we know we have plane strain because the material can get longer in this direction, but it cannot, it, it cannot change its width. And the reason why it's, it cannot change its width, it's because it's constrained <coughs> by the presence of the punch. The punch surface is there. Yeah? So it's just basically stuck against, yeah? it cannot get smaller yeah? uh, or, or larger, yes? Okay, so that's plain strain. And we know, uh, and this was really important, that, we could, that you can have texture hardening, yes? Uh, uh, and at, at higher R values, you can delay the yielding, okay? Which makes the material uh, basically uh, stronger in, in the important places. Hmm? You, you don't want fracture here, you don't want fracture here, and you want the material to be able to flow here, yes? And this is not the drawing part, is not very dangerous, yes? And we'll see in a moment why that is. Okay, but before we can do that, we need to talk a little bit about strains, yes? Strains in more detail, all right. So say I have a piece of material, yes? And in this piece of material, I have, I imagine a little sphere of material. And now I deform this material. Um, and in this particular case, I've, uh, uh, what did I do? Oh yeah, I squashed it. I squashed it by half. And uh, so because I squashed it, I have to uh, elongate it you know, because I uh, um, have to keep my volume in plastic deformation. Yeah? And then I, um, I moved it uh, to the right and I turned it around. So uh, moving, a uh, translation and rotation doesn't do anything, right, to the deformation, right? So this original little circle will turn into an ellipse, yes? It will always do this. I mean, you can do this at home with like a plastic foil or, or any time you have it, it has to be small enough, right? Small enough volume. What's small enough? Well, millimeter sized, yes. Um, millimeter cube size, or uh, um, this uh, circle will turn into an ellipse. Mm -hmm. And um, it's really nice because we automatically know our principal directions, yes. You always know your principal directions. Yeah? And that makes the analysis of strains easy. Yes? In sheet forming, instead of looking at a little volume of material, we just etch a little circle on the surface. And if we do the deformation, this little circle will turn into an ellipse. Yes. And if we deform it, it'll turn into an ellipse, which may change its shape, yes, through its, but it eventually it will end being a, not, a, you know, a final ellipse, yes? And so this allows us to look at this, to define the strains in terms of principal strains, yes? We, you know, we don't have to worry about uh, 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 shear stresses, uh, uh, shear strains, etc. Mm -hmm. because we automatically have a very uh, simple um, way of analyzing our uh, observations. Mm -hmm. right. what, what do I mean? Mm -hmm. Well, um, let's just look at a situation, the situation that happens in the flange of a cup test mm -hmm. or in any flange of a part that you, uh, where you do dip drawing. Mm -hmm. um, your circle, little circle that you put on the surface, um, changes, for instance, into this ellipse. Yeah? So it's, it's been squashed in one direction and elongated in another direction. Wh where does this type of deformation happen? Well, it happens here. Yeah? If, if I draw a little circle here, okay, um, 
if, I, if I, on my original sample, I have a little circle here, yeah? and I track this little circle during the formation, I will find that this original little circle that looked like this is now elongated in this direction and squashed in the other direction, yes? Hmm? Okay. Okay, so uh, it's a little circle at the beginning, so uh, the, the diameter is L0, yes? I do this type of straining, which we call, this particular type of straining is called drawing, yes? Uh, and now, this has now, is now an ellipse shape. And I can measure this ellipse. I can measure the length this direction, I can measure the length in that direction, yes? So if I make the natural logarithm of end length in the principal direction divided by the starting length for, for uh, uh, one uh, of the major direction and then for the other major direction, principal direction, L2 divided by L0 and then take the natural logarithm, I basically have the two principal strengths. Yeah, two principal strains. Okay, and because it's plastic deformation, I automatically have the, the third principal direction, which is perpendicular to the sheet. Yes? And we know, because the volume is constant in plastic deformation, that the strain in the one, the second, and the third principal direction must be zero. So as soon as I measure two of the principal directions, I have the third one. Yes? Okay. Okay. So these two are in the plane, and this is perpendicular to the plane, in plane, in the plane of the sheet. Okay. Uh, but of course, when, when you deform a, a sheet, it, you know, the circle can do other things, right? For instance, uh, it can just expand isotropically. If I pull by actually uh, this circle, as I increase uh, the, 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 the strains, I can have a perfect circle uh, after the deformation, right? So that is stretching. It's called stretching. Yeah? Or I can have plain strain, where one of the strains doesn't change. One of the strains is zero. And I stretch the material only in one direction. Hmm? Yeah. And the nice thing with uh, this approach is that any deformation, you can give a sheet, yes? can be represented on, the, on this graph, yes? You don't need a third dimension, yes? Um, you, you, uh, we'll see how we can put in information about thickness on this graph in a moment, yes? But that's basically it, yeah? And of course, why would we do this? Because if I deform a material for instance, in this direction, eventually it'll, it'll fracture, yes? And I can indicate at what point this fracture happens. I, I, I obtain that way, I obtain what is called a forming limit diagram, okay? All right, but um, just again to simplify things, let's look at our tensile test because, you know, Tensile test is certainly if you do a tensile test on a flat sheet, yes, a flat material. Yeah. What happens in this case? Well, if you, um, you know, if you had a standard tensile specimen like this for sheet, yeah, and you know you would put some circles on this, a circle pattern, yes. Hmm. Um, y uh, we know that we have a length strain, yeah, we have a width strain, and we have a thickness strain. Okay, and um, so these circles would turn into ellipses 
of this nature, yes, because uh, there is no force that prevents uh, a reduction of the width, yes, and I get ellipses that look like this, yes. So a tensile test on this diagram, in this diagram, um, it would look like this. So a, you would start having a circle here, and then this circle would become longer and longer, like this, okay? But it would become, um, so the, the strain in this direction here is negative, and the strain in this direction is positive, yes? So you would have a strain path along this direction, yes? Eventually, you reach the um, a uniform elongation, right? You, you, you reach the, um, uh, the moment where the sample starts to neck, right? So uh, you can indicate this. At this moment, the sample starts to neck, yes? And at this moment, the sample breaks, okay? And this would be another way of presenting uh, the formability, as it were, for uh, your sample. Yeah? Okay. Right. So, okay, so I hope that's clear. Hmm? How, uh, okay, and, and so, so what, again, what, what we, uh, what, what we get is this two-dimensional graph where you put the major strain, so the larger of these two on, the, on this axis, and the smaller one on this axis. Yeah? And uh, so the, the major strain is always larger than the minor strain. Yeah? That's why it's called the major uh, strain. Uh, both of them are uh, principal strains, yes? And the minor strain in, in sheet forming can be either positive or negative. Hmm? Okay. All right. Good. Um, the way uh, you can study the behavior of the material in terms of how far can I deform before it starts to neck and fracture, yes, hmm? by using different type of samples. Okay. For instance, you remember this uh, bulge sample here, yes, um, when you uh, uh, put a punch uh, here under the, uh, the sample, you basically stretch into direction, yeah, so you, you obviously go, your, your strain path goes in this direction. Both the major strain and the minor strain are equal, yes, and positive. I can change the shape of the sample, yes, for instance, get this sample, and get the material to deform in such a way that I get plain strain, yes? And then look, when does this break? Yeah. Okay. Okay. So now let's add a, um, uh, the, the dimension of the thickness strain. So it's very simple, as I said. Um, we know that the sum of the principal strains is zero. It's, it's basically uh, expressing mathematically that the volume doesn't change. Yeah? So the thickness strain is minus major and minor strains. Yeah? Okay. So that means that um, at every uh, place here in the graph, I can uh, 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 draw a line of constant thickness strain, okay? okay. So for instance, uh, this is an interesting line here, okay? And uh, let me, uh, you'll it'll be very clear in a moment why that is an interesting line, yeah? Uh, the line here at 45 degree, what's, what's special about this? Along this line, the 
major strain is equal to the minor strain. Yes? Okay. So, um, excuse me. Um, the major strain is minus because this is negative, right? And this is positive. The major strain is is equal to minus the minor strain, right? So, the thickness strain plus the major strain plus the minor strain is zero, right? If if these two are equal in size and different sign, it means that thickness strain is zero, right? So, okay, thickness strain is zero. Right? So this line is the line of no change in thickness. So if you can do a deformation with a strain path along here, yes, your material will not thin, yes? Uh, right, and um, so, um, right, so, now you remember what R was, yeah? Uh, R is the ratio of the uh, width strain over the thickness strain, right? Hmm? Okay, so the, uh, um, uh, the, the line here, yes, this, this slope, if you, if you use this equation, uh, you can show that you have this when R is, is very large, arch when, when uh, R is infinite. Hmm? Why is that? Because width strain, thickness strain zero, yeah? That means R is infinite, okay? Infinite R, we don't have that. You know, in the best case, you can have R equals to two for steels, yes? Uh, or slightly larger, yes? So um, uh, strain paths along uh, this, uh, you know, you'd never find. But that's kind of the limit, and of course, uh, when you do deformations, deep drawing deformation, that's one of the reasons why you like to have R large, yes? It's because it allows you to do the deformation with strains that uh, have a minimum thickness reduction. And of course, thickness reduction is what happens on the way to fracture, right? So you want to avoid thickness reduction. Okay, so uh, if, and, and if you, uh, uh, look at um, the, um, uh, you know, use this, again, this equation uh, here. For instance, uh, you say, okay, um, uh, well, you, you plot, yeah. you basically plot uh, uh, constant, yeah? So, because, um, so the, um, the, v the um, excuse me, yeah. So if the thickness, if you say the thickness strain is a, is a constant, you know, say we assume the thickness strain is a constant, then um, it also means that the sum of the minor and the major strains is a constant, or the major strain is equal to constant minus the minor strain, yes? And, and so this, this basically means uh, these are lines with a negative slope, yeah? So these lines here are lines of thickness strain, of negative thickness strain. Here it's zero, yes? In this case, it's 10% or 0.1 uh, thickness strain, 0.2 thickness strain, 0.3 thickness strain. Etc. So when I move from, from here to here, I, I get thinning of the material, yes? The material gets thinner. Deformations get thinner. Right. 
in this diagram also there are areas where uh, uh, where you where you cannot um, where there are no solutions basically that's this one this area here yes the the minor strain uh, can never be larger than the major strain right so there's there's no this is a white region of this plot right because the major strain is always larger than the minor strain. So this, this we don't have. In this area, we can't usually come because of the, um, the thickening. Hmm? Although um, we, we have seen uh, that um, it, it can, um, it, it does occur at, uh, at the flange region, right? You, you can have situations where the, the deformation path is such that uh, that you get into this region where the material gets thicker. Yeah? So that's not impossible. Hmm? And we'll see some examples in a moment. Hmm? But, but, but this region is really a white region. No, nope, there cannot be data points there. Hmm? Okay? Right. So, um, so you have this uh, feeling that on this diagram I can plot for certain strain paths. Yes? I can plot... Uh, combinations of strains, of major strains and mi minor strains, uh, where, uh, where the fracture will occur. Well, so this is an example here. I, I, I have this thing, this sample here. Hmm. Uh, and um, you know, I push a, a punch underneath it, so it's str the, the material gets stretched in two directions, yes, in positive amounts. So I have minor strain at... Uh, uh, major strain are equal, yes, in size. So I move, I make this, you know, this circle, little, my circle grids expand, 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 yes. I start to get a crack and then it breaks, right? And I can measure, I can say, okay, well, that moment, yes, I make a point here, yes. And then I try to build this for the rest of the deformation modes, yes, and I can determine a range where the deformations yes, will be safe, will not lead to uh, necking and fracture. Hmm? And of course, the larger I can make this range, yes, the better my formability is. Yeah? Right, so... Um, um, okay, so how... How would you do this? Because it looks like, my God, you know, how, how can I do, you know, uh, different uh, strain paths? It's obvious, you know, in a, uh, what I showed you here, uh, you have, you know, you can make strain paths. Or if I do biaxial, I can make uh, also a very well-defined strain path. Yes? Uh, well, it's, there is a, what's called the uh, Nakazima approach, which you basically do is you, you basically take a s samples, yes? Uh, you use the same device, the uh, same um, um, bulge test, yes? Mm -hmm. uh, where the punch is basically a, uh, a dome, yes? Mm -hmm. And when you want to do the biaxial test, you have uh, a full dome, yes? If a full square or round blank, yes? If you want to do the other uh, strain pass, you reduce the width of the sample. You can see it becomes progressively narrower and narrower and narrower. And here it's a very narrow strip. Yes? And when, when you do this, basically go from stretching to deep drawing or, or uniaxial tension. Yeah? Uh, just um, just in, uh, for, for those who are not familiar with, in this test you don't make a cup, yes? The edges of the sample are firmly gripped, yes? You really deform the material, yes? It doesn't flow, it doesn't flow towards the center, right? It's not like in the cup, when you make cup forming tests, you really want the material to flow and form, you know, the cup, yeah? In, in this case, when you're doing this FLD 
uh, uh, you, you firmly keep the edge from moving, going anywhere, okay? All right, so, so uh, what you do is on all these samples, you make little circle grids. You put little circle grids and, um, and you measure. You, you basically measure, for instance, okay? So this is an example of some measurements. So let's just look at biaxial strain. This would be, for instance, a sample here uh, of um, a relatively small sample of uh, 30 uh, centimeter by 30 centimeters. Yes, a sheet, little small sheet like this. And uh, I've put a circle grid over this uh, sample and I measure the strain. Yes, the strains over this, the bulge. Yes, and this is, this is what I get. Yeah. This is a biaxial situation. So the, the stresses, the strains, excuse me, in one direction and the perpendicular should be about equal, right? And you, you can see, you can see the squares fall on top of the, uh, the other uh, symbols, yeah? They're the same. Yeah? The thickness strain is very large and minimum because when you stretch in two directions, everything has to come from thickness, okay? How much is it? Well, uh, you have about 0.4 strain for each one of them, so each direction. So volume is constant, so the thickness strain should be the sum of this, the two, 0.4 plus 0.4 minus, yeah? So about 0.8, and that's what you get, yeah? Plain strain, yes, we're in a situation where we're in this situation here. So we have a positive major strain and a zero minor strain. Yes, so positive major strain, positive major strain, negative minor strain. The reason why this changes here it's because I'm, I'm measuring different positions on the sample, right? Okay. And, and this, excuse me, this point here is where it starts to break or where it starts to, um, um, yeah, where it starts to fracture. Hmm? Okay, so, so in this case, my minor strain is uh, uh, zero, yeah, zero. So all the uh, uh, l uh, lengthening is translated into thickness strain thinning. Mm -hmm. And this is the situation here where I'm at the other end. Mm -hmm. So in this, in this case, mm -hmm. this specimen here, if I measure the strains there, mm -hmm. I find uh, a positive major strain, a negative minor strain, and this, that's where you get the smallest thickness strain. Hmm? And that's, that's to be expected because we get closer to this line, yeah, of the zero thickness strain. Hmm? Okay, now, now in this um, figure here, this is data. This is actually measurements here. And you can see uh, at these points here, this point here in particular, right, and this point here, that's where the fracture occurs, yes? This, this, these are measurements made very close to the crack, yes? So these are the points that I will put on my diagram, you see? So this is for instance for low carbon steel and for a so-called dual phase steel data, yes? So in, um, for instance, the po this point here corresponds to a measurement for major and minor strain where the, the, I will have fracture, okay? Okay, and so this allows me, yes, to define a region of deformations and strains where it's safe to deform the material. Up to that amount of deformation, I can deform the material 
without problems. Hmm? Okay, and um, so obviously you want this line to be as high as possible. Yeah, as high as possible. Okay, and the uh, uh, so the minimum in this line, yes, with an um, yes, this this is called the FLC zero point here. This this point here is very much determined by the strain hardening. Yes, the strain hardening. Okay, so the larger our strain hardening our n value, yes, if you want, is the higher our FLD uh, uh, forming limit curve hmm, uh, comes. Hmm. I always get um, confused with the words. So th this forming limit diagram, forming limit curve, this curve here is the forming limit curve, yes, and this point is very dependent on the n value. So, so you want this point to be as high as possible because it gives me a lot of uh, space, as it were, in strain space where I can deform without having fracture. Okay? We reach the uh, end of the lecture time. So we'll meet on uh, Tuesday next week. And um, in the meanwhile, have a good day.